Uh, well, actually, bro brother Bobby asked me to give a talk today, and he says he wants a general talk. I think what general talk? Something general. So I'm thinking, then he said a catchy title. So that's, that's, uh, that's asking a lot there, eh? general talk. So I say, why well, wouldn't we say why Buddhism is, is true? Because that's actually the title of the book. I think maybe many of you already know this for almost two years now. Have you heard of that book? Oh, why Buddhism is true? But I'm not going to talk about that book. <laughs> because that book is actually about uh, Buddhism and evolutionary, uh, evolutionary psychology. And I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, so I'm going to talk to you about it. But basically, uh, that book is about why, why certain aspects of Buddhism is, is true. The author of the book is a guy called Robert Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. Uh, that book came out, I think, in 2018. It was, uh, it was a bestseller on the New York Times, and uh, it became very popular. And there were many, pod you can even go to podcasts on why Buddhism is true, a lot of uh, interviews uh, with Robert Wright. What he said is, is that there are different facets of Buddhism. You know, there's the smells and bells types of Buddhism, <laughs> and there's, there's, there's also the, the, the psychological aspects of Buddhism. And he said that in the West, when people go to meditation, those who go to Vipassana tend to be psychologists. Those who go to Zen tend to be poets. poets. Those who go to Tibetan and the Shambhala meditation tend to be artists. Correct. <laughs> so I'm not sure what so what of meditation that we do here. Maybe we do a lot of meta and personal. Okay. Anyway, today, since I've given the talk, uh, why Buddhism is. If I stand here, am I blocking? Is this okay? Now, have you seen this little booklet before? Do you have this in your library? Maybe not many of you are that. Uh, many of you are too, too young, maybe even to, to know who K. Sri Dhammananda is. Right? Many years ago, when, 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 when I was a teenager, right, uh, trying to understand Buddhism, there were very few books on Buddhism those, those days. Right? And the late Venerable K. Sri Dhammananda was, was actually one of the few uh, authors who wrote books on Buddhism in English those days. Today, you have plenty of books. Right? And I remember, when I was in university, there was this book called Buddhism in the Eyes of Intellectuals. And what the late Venerable did was to compile snippets or selections of quotes by those days, basically philosophers, uh, well, some scientists, historians, H.G. Wells, Arthur Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and a few psychologists, not, not so many psychologists, about why Buddhism uh, why they find Buddhism attractive and why some of them even practice Buddhism. Those were, this must be the, this were compiled like in the 50s and 60s, right? And anyone have seen this before? No. It's, a, it's not a, a very thick book, it's a short one. Well, this is how the book looks like. So you can see, I think you can see Einstein there. Right? Einstein says that uh, if, there's, if, there's a, if there's any religion that can cope with modern science, it, was, it must be a cosmic religion. And that religion could be, could be Buddhism. This was stated way back in the 50s. Right? So a lot of things have since passed. Okay? So today, when we ask ourselves, what is Buddhism? All right? As I said, if you read Robert Wright's book, he says the form of the kind of Buddhism he's talking about the type of Buddhism, he says, is true. It's not the type of Buddhism where you read about rainbow bodies. You know what are rainbow bodies? <laughs> you read about reincarnation. He said he doesn't know about all, all the stuff. But he said what he finds is true is uh, that aspects of the teaching where the, where the Buddha says, we suffer because we do not see the world clearly. Right? And then he looks back at the evolutionary psychology. He looks at the Darwin's theory of natural selection, even there's a lot of truth in what the Buddha has, has Buddha said 2,600 years ago. So on that basis, he said Buddhism is true. All right? But as I think all of us are practitioners of the Dharma, we also know that when the Buddha says that his teachings is true, that's just one aspect. Isn't it? There's two other aspects about truth. 
the truth that the Buddha talks about must be useful. It must be relevant to our uh, deliverance, to our liberation, eventually. And sometimes the truth can be pleasant, and sometimes the truth cannot be pleasant, unpleasant. All right? So truth in Buddhism is not truth per se, but truth which is useful. Useful for our deliverance, isn't it? If you look at the first discourse the Buddha said, remember the first discourse, turning the emotion to the view of the law? Buddha has only one thing to teach, dukkha, which is unsatisfactoriness, and how do we overcome dukkha? So the entire teachings of the Buddha, 45 years, you can say, comprises only on one thing. For us to understand the nature of existence, which is unsatisfactory, right. and how do we make that satisfactory? And that is actually the, the, the essence of, of uh, Robert Wright's book, why Buddhism is, is true. Because why he's saying it, 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 is that there are, the, while the Buddha acknowledged that, uh, yes, there's unsatisfactoriness in existence, but there's also a way, there's also a method. And of course, he mentioned mindfulness meditation. And for those of us who have done mindfulness meditation, it helped us to, to reassess how we look at our ceilings, for example. Isn't it? That's why in our uh, mindfulness meditation, one aspect is mindfulness on feelings. Beta and Vipassana. So feelings plays a very important part. Now, if you look at Buddhism, you find that you can actually look at it in, in two aspects. Right? <clears throat> Sometimes we practice only the religious aspects of Buddhism, right? not the spiritual aspect. What is the religious aspects of Buddhism? These will be the beliefs, the dogmas, the prayers, the rituals, the heaven and hell that we believe in, the faith, the divine beings. Right? Right? You find people say, oh, after coming back from, from the temple, you know, I, I got the presence of some, some unseen beings, you know, they seem to be very nice to me. Right? So people have that aspect of, of Buddhism as a religion, yes. but he said Buddhism, yes, that, that is also a form of, of Buddhism. And you are into other forms of Buddhism, they talk about divinity, they talk about oracle, and so on. But, but there's also another aspect of Buddhism, which increasingly we try to emphasize <coughs> when we come to a Dharma center, when we, when we study the teaching, when we try to practice. And this is got to do with the spirituality aspect. It is things like compassion, things like forgiveness, things like contentment, Patience, tolerance, kindness, love, gratitude, respect, you know. So that's the other whole thing here about, about spirituality, which also forms Buddhism, right? So we ask ourselves, you know, when we say we are Buddhist, which aspects of Buddhism are we, are we practicing? You may say, I'm a very strong Buddhist, you know, I come to temple every Sunday, I'm a vegetarian, at least at least minimum twice a month. All right, because you have a lot of beliefs, you do a lot of rituals, you believe in heaven and hell. Right? You can quote the 31 places of existence very, very cleverly. You say, I have a lot of faith in the Buddha, in the Dharma, in the Sangha. But you don't practice compassion. You may pray to Kuan Yin, but to you, Kuan Yin is just a statue. But you don't embody Kuan Yin. You don't embody what Kuan Yin represents. Right? Is that forgiveness? You never forgive. <laughs> you say, I can forget, I can never forgive. <laughs> we are never contented. We never practice patience. <laughs> we have no tolerance at all. We have zero, zero tolerance. We, we don't even think that kindness needs to be reciprocated. <laughs> so we don't really practice all these aspects. Now, if we don't do all these things, then we're not practicing the Dharma. <laughs> So we have to ask ourselves, are we practicing Buddhism or practicing the Dharma? Well, people say, if you practice Buddhism, you are practicing the religion. But if you practice Dharma, you are practicing the spirituality aspect. You know, the late chief, I always remember, he says, Buddhism is a 2,600-year-old religion or tradition. Buddhism has changed. You know? That's why you've got Chinese Buddhism, you've got Vietnamese Buddhism, you've got, uh, now you've got American Buddhism. English Buddhism, right? Very soon when you have Malaysian Buddhism, the Buddha will wear a song called <laughs> So it, eventually it, it will happen. But you have different myriad forms of Buddhism. So Buddhism must change. If Buddhism doesn't change, it will disappear. Isn't it? The very fact that the, the teachings of the Buddha remain for more than two and a half millennium is because Buddhism, the outer shell, has changed over the years. 
That is why you look at you go to a Chinese Buddhist temple, you find that Buddhism looks very different from if you walk into a, a Sinhalese Buddhist temple or you go to a Tibetan Buddhist temple. So that is Buddhism. So that has changed. Right? That's why the Buddha images looks like the Thai king. Huh? <laughs> right? But in Burma, Buddha tend to be fatter. And in China, they even fatter. Because to the Chinese, uh, wealth and prosperity would be fat. <laughs> so we have, we have, we have, uh, we have personified uh, this concept into, the, into our own image. So that must change. It doesn't change in the system. But you look within it. You look within all these forms of Buddhism. You find that there's something that, is, that doesn't really uh, change over, over the years. And things like formable truth, things like compassion, forgiveness, contentment, patience, others, all these values does not really change. Okay? So why Buddhism is, is true today, I'm going to share with you some of these aspects, spirituality, which increasingly we find are more and more in the topic. And this uh, and a lot of research has been done. This is the very first book that I mentioned to you when late Chief Reverend made the compilation of those snippers and quotes and messages from, from people like H.G. Wells, the historian, to Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, to even Kekuka, right? Uh, uh, talking about existentialism. So all, all those things were quoted in that book. So today I'm going to share, share with you some selections here. So let's look at spirituality and happiness. Remember I, I, I mentioned the aim of Buddhism is to find us, to help us understand the nature of, of our existence, which is unsatisfactory, and how to eventually find happiness. Okay. So that is quote here from Dr. Craig Hassett. So I've used names which you are not familiar with, who are not necessarily Buddhist, just to show you a very objective portrayal of what's happening in the world today. So Dr. Craig Hassett from Monash says, what is spirituality? It is the quality of a person's core values. If one expresses compassion in one's daily life, respect and live according to natural laws and principles, what, what immediately comes to your mind when you hear the word natural laws as a Buddhist? What, what, what is a natural law? Huh? Universal law. So what do we call it as a Karma is a natural law. The niyama, for those of you who are more familiar with Buddhism, the five natural laws. But karma, we all know karma. So karma is a natural law. Nobody creates karma. Did, 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 the, did the Buddha create the law of karma? No. The law of karma has always been there. Like, did anybody, did Isaac Newton create the law of gravity? He didn't create the law of gravity. The law of gravity is that you go against the law of gravity, you go to the top floor, you jump down, you break your leg and you break your ankle. Right. That's a natural law. So you break the law, you don't understand the law of karma says that you know if you bad actions eventually leads to bad results. It's a natural law. Okay? So Craig says that if we live in accordance with natural laws and principles and believe in the interconnectedness of life is living a spiritual life. And this word again, interconnectedness of life. That's, that's a word which you find so increasingly been mentioned again and again in Buddhism. Right? Interconnectedness, interdependence. interdependence. In one very famous Mahayana Sutra called the uh, Avatamsaka Sutra. You know the Avatamsaka It's a very big Mahayana Sutra. He says you, you, he says you imagine up in the sky, you know the sky is infinite, uh, the night sky, right? You, you imagine there's a, there's a magician who have cast a huge net over the night sky. You know, nets, they've got, they've got holes there, right? And in each of the net, you put a jewel, a, a sparkling, glittering jewel in each of the net. And you know, you, you, you imagine the whole universe, the whole sky of a, of a net, you know, all filled with sparkling jewel. What will happen if you, if you, if you move, if the magician moves that, that net, that, that net you find that you, you find glittering effect, a, a wonderful sight to behold, right? But you observe closely, each of that jewel also ref, re reflects the light from the other jewel. Perfect. Each of the jewels, each of the jewels individually. So in the Avatamsaka Sutra, 
is a, just an analogy. That's called the uh, jewel net of Indra. In Indra is the in, in the in, in Indian Buddhism, in Indra is subsequently became sak, uh, Sakra or Sakra. So in Indra, so it's called Indra's net. So you look at that. So that is to remind us how we are all interdependent. We are all interdependent. So it's a very profound teaching, let's say, in that Mahayana teaching. But we know the interconnectedness of life. So he's living a spiritual. So studies have shown that a person's level of happiness ultimately depends less on the religion and much more on the core spiritual values. <laughs> So you, you can say you are a very religious person, but if you don't practice those spiritual values, then you, you can't be very far from being you know, an unhappy person. I also remember the late chief, you know, once he, he was saying, you know, you know Breakfield's temple is an old, tem old temple, there's a lot of old people there, <laughs> those, those, those days, uh, maybe many of them passed away. There was one, one gentleman who had been there for many, many years, and, and then he's, and one day he came to the late chief and he says, you know, Despite all, all the time in, in this temple, I'm still very unhappy. You know? So she asked him a simple question. Do you know what is the teachings of the Buddha? Do you know what the Buddha actually taught? Or uh, I, I don't really read the teachings of the Buddha. You know, right? Because he, he doesn't really study the teaching, he doesn't really practice the teaching. But without fail, he comes to the temple on Sunday. Without fail, you know, he, he will do dana. Without fail, he will, he will do this, he will do chanting. So, if he does a lot of the religious aspects, but he doesn't practice the spiritual aspects. So, so something for us to, to ask ourselves. Right? If we say we are Buddhists, are we only practicing the religious aspects, or are we also trying to practice, inculcate the spiritual values that Buddha talks about? And throughout the, the subsequent slide, I'll show you what are these spiritual values, and how important they are. Remember, the aim of Buddhism is, well, we are all here because we hope we can find something that can make our life richer, more meaningful, and happier, isn't it? Otherwise, why, why are we here? You can't be running away from the virus that comes to the GF, right? <laughs> so, I'm sure that... So, so this is, a, I think, it's a very interesting statement. Okay? Now, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says there are two kinds of happiness for monks. Worldly happiness and spiritual happiness. But spiritual happiness, I have to do. Data happiness and Tameless happiness. So by tameless happiness, is higher too. So bodily happiness and mental happiness. So mental happiness, higher to pleasure happiness, and happiness of equality. Happiness with equality is higher. Now I show you this slide just to tell you that Buddhism is, is not all pessimism. Some people say, oh, you know, after end of each Buddhist talk, you hear nothing but suffering. As you are not suffering. <laughs> when I come to a Buddhist talk, I listen for more suffering. <laughs> so the aim is not that. There is actually happiness in Buddhism. Uh, in fact, there's a very interesting article uh, written by Joseph Dosi, who's a very well-known uh, Vipassana teacher. He talks about the evolution of happiness. Right? So evolution of happiness, we must start with worldly happiness. Some people have the mistaken uh, notion that, uh, oh, you know, you know, I want to go high level, dharma practice, worldly happiness, I just want to go spiritual happiness, I only want to be banic happiness. <laughs> you can't have the happiness, you can't even take care of your worldly happiness. Right? In, in another uh, very famous teaching which the Buddha gave a, a lay person, not a monk, but a lay person, Dikajami. Buddha said there are eight types of happiness, four types of worldly happiness and four types of spiritual happiness. And all those happiness are important. So in others you don't, don't imagine you're going to have spiritual happiness if you don't even understand what is worldly happiness. So worldly happiness are necessary, but unfortunately they are not, not adequate. <laughs> not enough. You need more than that. Right. But they are important. They are important. Okay? So, this is mentioning the Anguttara. Okay. So, we, we know the Buddha did not deny that happiness is important. Okay? Well, even the ancient Greeks, Aristotle said there are two types of happiness. In it. So, today we hear this word well being, right? Remember this word becoming very, very common now? And uh, psychologists not like to use this word well-being. We like to talk about welfare today. We talk about well-being. And uh, there was this this guy Martin Seligman who talks about positive psychology. He talks about flourishing, 
<laughs> the scholars who, who understand flourishing. So in other, how do you have a flourishing life? Well-being, you know. So happiness that comes from meaningful pursuits. What a meaningful pursuit people think about. And happiness that comes from pleasure of the senses. So this is what in Buddhism we call the worldly happiness. Right? Okay? This is what we call maybe the, 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 this higher level of happiness, spiritual happiness. So both are actually important. So it's not only the Buddha who talks about it, even the ancient Greeks talks about it. Okay? No, it's, no, it's Aristotle. Right? <laughs> spiritual values. Okay, let's see what are the spiritual values that in, in Buddhism uh, the Buddha says are true and useful for us to practice. Remember, to, to qualify for something as true, and, and, and Buddha mentioned this in many, many discourses, it must be also useful. Sometimes pleasant to listen to, sometimes not pleasant to listen to. So the, the classic uh, discourse Buddha gave is the, the discourse he gave to a young prince called Prince Abhaya Kumara. So the name of the discourse is called Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. <laughs> so in that discourse, on that sutta itself, Buddha talks about uh, something is true, it must be useful, it can be pleasant, it can be unpleasant. Okay? So let, let's see what, what are these things. So these are the spiritual values which are very important for us as Buddhists, as practitioners of the Dharma. Maybe not as Buddhists, but as Dharma practitioners, right? Yeah, of course, Dana, uh, Dana, Sila, gratitude, contentment, friendship, right livelihood, compassion, mindfulness. Now, this obviously is not exhaustive, right? This list is not exhaustive, but I'm just giving you a, just a selection. Okay? So let's, let's take a quick one. Let's talk about generosity. Again, I've, I've given you extracts from non-Buddhist sources. I, I, I want you to, to know that all these have got a like contemporary relevance, right? So if you read this book called Happy Money, right? and you'll be happy with money, I think we can have happier. We can also be sad, right? We don't have, we don't have enough of money. So this is what uh, Professor of Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, of Psychology from University of British Columbia said in this book. He said those who spend more on others reported much greater happiness than those who spend it on themselves. <laughs> so this is the, the, the research from, from this book. Right? So you, you, you can read this book and then you find out all the So this is an, an extra. Right? Those who spend more on others reported much greater happiness than those who spend it on themselves. In Buddhism, we talk about dana. Right? So in the dana sutta, he said, and which are the three factors of the donor? There's a case where the donor, before giving, is glad. While giving, his or her mind is bright and clear, and after giving, he is gratified. <laughs> so you know what this means? So when we, when we do dana, sometimes people, after doing dana, they go back home, they regret. Ay, today I'm wasting my time. I, I cook so much food, you know. I thought the chief punk would come. Today they send a young, young chiku there, young, young one. Very little merits today. <laughs> Have you, I've got people who mentioned that. All they say, ah, yeah, that monk, I don't like that monk. Ah, yeah, today they said that monk. <laughs> you know about your favorite monk and your certain monk you don't like, isn't it? Sure, everybody has that those things. So when you do dana, so that, that action becomes polluted. Even the act of dana is good, all right, but because of the intention, because of the thoughts, because of the motivation in the mind, we, we, we destroy those good seeds that we wanted to plant. Right. So very important. You want to do something good? Before you do it, make sure that you have a good thoughts, good motivation. Why you want to do it? Alright? Okay? Then while doing, be happy that yeah, you're doing something useful. And after that, yeah, appreciate. Well, it doesn't only mean giving food to monks, I'm just giving that example. It could be, for example, you're doing charity, you want to give a donation to an old folks home, you want to give a charity to a, to a hospice, or you just want to do something to help somebody else. You want to do something good. Right? And that's also the meaning of generosity, isn't it? Right? Because generosity, there are different levels. The, the Buddha says one can be a king of king giver, a king giver, a king. Right? So in other words, you, you, you give even things which you yourself uh, would not have. 
what you give to somebody else because something needs it more, you give. So that's called a king giver. You can also be a, a, a beggar gift giver. You know what's a beggar giver? You give those things because you're thinking, hey, why am I going to keep all those wooden chairs and those, those three legs left, you know? Like that. And then I don't know where, where, where to put them. Suddenly, BJF needs to think, okay, give this chair to BJF. Thank goodness, you know, I, can, I, can, I can clear my house of this stuff. Or during tsunami, you, you hear about people giving away all the torn clothes and underwear and singlets and they can't use. So give it away. It's a, it's a time for them to, to, to clear whatever they have at home. Well, is that not giving? Of course it's giving. It is giving. It is dana. But that dana is got very little merit. Because you are giving away things which you give. Sometimes you, you give out of greed. Because if I give something, maybe I can get something back. If I sign this SD, you know, maybe, who you knows, maybe, uh, you know, SD, you know, SD. You don't know SD, I, you know, you're not the man of the world. You're, you're otherworldly, you're very spiritual. So people give, because they want to get something in. Right? Some people give out of anger. I, I, you know, I just throw away, just throw it at them. So we, we, we give based on different, different motivations, right? So very important is, what goes on in our mind? That is why in, in, in Buddhist literature, you got this word dana, right? Isn't it? To all of us are familiar. Actually, there's another word which is similar to, to this, which has got a higher quality in the sense of a spirit, which is called chaga. You know chaga? They were C A G A. You heard of Buddha Nusati? When they do recollection on the Buddha, like, well, like what you did, did this morning, he did this whole Kakawa, Arahang, Samma, Sambuto, Vijayacharya. Then you reflect on the qualities, the nine qualities of the Buddha, right? You can do the Dhamma Nusati, so So you reflect on the six qualities of the Dhamma, and likewise you can reflect on the nine qualities of the Sangha. But you can also reflect on the good deeds that you have done, Chaka Nusati. Right? So you have done something good, you, you reflect. Did I do this good act? For example, like the Dhamma Sutta. Did I do it? Uh, with a, with a mind of with a positive mind, or do I do it with a negative mind? So you reflect on the goodness that you have done. So it's a form of contemplation, form of reflection. So it's also a form of meditation. Right? So, so in Buddhism there are different forms of meditation. Right? Not only breathing in, breathing out. Okay? Right? Or rising in different forms. So chakra nusati, just a Buddha nusati, recollection of the qualities of the Buddha, the form of meditation. Uh, like in Chinese Buddhism, the Nian Fo, you know, Nian Fo, the Chanting the name of, of Amitabha Buddha. So it's an extension of the Buddha Nusati. Right? It's an extension of that. Okay. So Dhamma is, is important, but uh, we got to do it right. Okay. Ethics. Uh, Harvey James uh, quote this survey, the World Value Survey 205 to 06, that people who believe that unethical scenarios that are not acceptable also tend to indicate they are more happy with life. So being ethical, it seems, isn't just worthy, but just might make you happier. So what is ethics? Ethics, of course, in, as, as Buddhists, we talk about what is the close, what comes to mind immediately when, when you talk about ethical behaviors? What should we do? What do we observe? How, how, how do we uh, practice ethics in our everyday life? Do you have any idea? <laughs> yeah, how, how, how do we inculcate good, good morals? By doing what? This morning you also recited it, right? Didn't you recite the punches here? The five precepts? The, the five precepts is, is, a, is the manifestation of our ethical behavior. Right? Except that the, the five precepts tells you basically what not to do. Some people say, then, then what to do? <laughs> You see, you look exactly at the five precepts. The five, what did the five precepts tell you? Tells you what not to do, right? Did it tell you what, what to do? No need, so no, no need to do, just keep five precepts. You know? <laughs> the first precept says abstain from killing. So, okay, well, you don't kill. Done. Job done. <laughs> There's more to it, right? I'm not sure if we do, do we do we recite the bunch of dumb, I think we do, right? So we also have the positive side. Right? Which is, uh, instead of not killing or not harming other beings, we, we practice compassion. Right? 
uh, instead of not uh, instead of not uh, what is the second precept uh, stealing instead of not taking things which is not not given so we you, you give we practice generosity and then the question is how do we practice generosity so this is what the question third precept so instead of uh, instead of instead of breaking the third precept of sexual misconduct so so what what, what is the the counterbalance to that? What is the counterbalance to the third precept? First precept, the positive aspects is compassion. Second precept, the, 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 the positive aspects is generosity or dharma. What's the third precept? Don't get married. <laughs> what is the third precept? What, what is the counterbalance to that? Instead of abstaining from sexual mis misconduct, what do we do? Huh? Meditate? Yeah, of course, we meditate all the time, but we, what is that specific quality that we need to do? Sometimes you, you meditate, you meditate in your mind, all, all, all the sexual thoughts will get right. So, so we practice contentment. Right? Contentment is right? also a, a, a practice of contentment. Mindfulness may, may be right. Okay, the fourth precept of lying, quite easy, right? We, we, tell, we speak the truth. But again, then, the, then you will read the teachings. The, the truth is not just saying the, the truth. In the another discourse called the Vacha Sutta, Vacha means speech. Vacha Sutta in the Dharmika. Buddha said, even though something is true, something is useful, when you say it, it's also very important. Alright? So, what does that, that mean? The time, the timeliness of your speech. It doesn't mean that every time it is true, you just say it. I mean, it's, it's, the time is not right. Impermanence, suffering, isn't it? for example, is true. We all know it's true. Buddha talks about it. But you just been invited for a friend's wedding. You say, oh, congratulations, but you know that life is impermanent. <laughs> your wedding also is impermanent. Your marriage may be impermanent. Well, is that the right time to say such thing? Is that the right place to say such thing? So the Buddha says in the Vacha Sutta, even though something is true, you must have some wisdom. When to say it. The time limit. <clears throat> In fact, there are five, there are five, uh, five, five characteristics in what constitutes a good speech. And one of it is timeliness. So the Buddha was very precise. He was a great communicator. Right? So every teaching that he gave us was very well qualified. Five precepts by itself, just understand five precepts is actually not, not quite so sufficient. Because even the fourth precept of lying, you can actually expand it. For example, in the ten wholesome actions, the ten unwholesome actions, you find that actually uh, it's not just not telling a lie, but also no harsh speech, no backbiting, you know, uh, you know, no gossip. But of course there's there's positive gossip, right? As Ajahn Brahm would say, that's what he said, I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, so with ethics, so ethical, so in Buddhism, ethics is very important. And ethics, we always bring in the precepts. Let's talk about five precepts if we are lay people. Okay? Sila, so we call it Sila. So in both the discourse, a life of happiness, wisdom, and compassion begins with a commitment to ethical living. So the five precepts invite us to live a life of non-harming and loving kindness through the deep investigation of action, speech, and thoughts. If you, if you understand the five precepts, actually, it's actually when we practice the five precepts, it's actually helping us to guard our three doors. We all have three doors. <laughs> all right? Uh, you know what are the three doors? Right? The mind door, the, the mouth, the speech, and then the body. All right? That's why Sun Chi say what? Speak, what? Think good thoughts, say good words, do good things. All right? Sun Chi's motto, right? Huh? Is it? Oh, Fo Gong San. Okay, okay. Ch 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 Chinese master. Fo, Fo Gong San. Okay. So, think good thoughts, uh, say good words, and do good deeds. That is because there's karma. And what is karma? Buddha says karma is intention. It's our intention that, that is karma. If there's no intention, there's no karma. Right? So you have good intention, good karma. Bad intention, bad karma. Okay. Okay, so very important. So sila. Now the five precepts are found in both discourses. So sometimes you know when I when I meet with Buddhist friends, they say, how 
Where, you know, you know, we are Christian very easy. Oh, you know, where, the, where it's found in the Bible, in the Quran, where it's found. But in Buddhism, where, where, did, where on earth did the Buddha say the five free Christians? Where on earth did oh, the chief rabbi say that? The late chief rabbi said that. But it's somewhere, isn't it? So it's actually many, many discourses, but these are the two main ones. Gratitude. Okay, so very important spiritual quality. We know, so this is uh, from Robert Emmons, right, from the book Gratitude Works. <laughs> so he wrote a book of Gratitude Works. He says, we know we should practice gratitude daily because it's good for us. It's good for our health and happiness. It's good for neutralizing negative emotions. <laughs> it's good for relationships. It's great for deepening our enjoyment of life and so many other things. So this is like taking vitamins. You know? It can be good for so many things, right? 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 Like you, you, you take that. So he said gratitude is, is good. Okay? And I, I, I remember, the person I remember best who always liked to speak on gratitude is Ajahn Sumido. Right? He likes to talk about gratitude. Right? The Pali word is, uh, you can see the next word, kata anyu. Kata anyu is the Pali word. Right? Gratitude, among other qualities, brings us blessings, meaning that it protects us against unhappiness. So if you have if you read the Maha Mangala Sutta, you know what is Maha Mangala Sutta, right? I'm sure you know. Yeah. And anybody who has, who has not heard of this? You all have, right? Ijev, uh, Ijev, the devotees are all very, very seasoned practitioners, high level practitioners. So in the Mangala Sutta, the Buddha talks about blessings. How many blessings there? Huh? Four blessings. Why should feel more now? Huh? How many blessings in the Mandala Sutta? How many blessings do you have talked about? 38. Ah, no, no, no. 38. Magic number 38. 38. Not 114. 38. So 38 is a magic number. 38 types of blessings. And one of the blessings is gratitude. Right? Gratitude. And then in the Dhammapada, it says, to one ever eager to revere and serve the elders, four blessings to cool. Long life, beauty, happiness, and power. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Especially the last one. Everybody wants power. <laughs> okay. So, so in all the Buddhist teachings, right, seems to seems to substantiate what uh, is mentioned in this book of gratitude works. And uh, of course, the discourses were spoken by the Buddha 2,600, 700 years ago. Right? But today you find that contemporaries and qualities, when they, when, when they look at all these spiritual qualities, they find that actually there is, there is truth, there is uh, efficacy in, in us actually for the okay? Contentment, see? This is uh, Richard Ryan from Australian Catholic University. The more we seek satisfaction in material goods, the less we find them there. <laughs> The satisfaction of a short half-life is very fleeting. People who put money high on the priority list are more at risk of depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem, hence less happiness. So all these extracts which I've given you, this talks about what makes us happy. Then. It's what actually gives us happiness. Right? And I believe it back to all the spiritual qualities which are so highly praised in Buddhism. Right? And, and today, you find that uh, modern psychologists, particularly, are uh, seeing that there's efficacy in what the Buddha has said. But this is a very important point. The satisfaction of short life, short half-life, is very fleeting. In that book, Why Buddhism is True, what Robert Wright is saying is, is that is, is, if you're looking at natural selection, right? that uh, we are, you know, just like animals, we are, we are always not satisfied. And he gave examples like you have your your, your favorite bowl of uh, noodles, you know, your, your favorite your favorite store. You, you eat it. Are you are you forever gratified? No, you need something for dinner. Right? And he said, sex. You know, you have sex. Does it mean that you have sex once after that you, you pass in glory forever, no more sex? No. So if that happens, that there'll be there'll be no more new genes to create new species. But, but because of that, you know, we, we keep on growing, we keep on wanting more and more and more. Right? So we are never satisfied. 
And, and then what Dukkha is, isn't it? Right? And that's what you know, that, that, that Dukkha is all about. Why is that Dukkha? Because the good things that we want, they don't stay. They are fleeting. The bad things that we don't want seems to stay longer than necessary. Right? Have you heard people say, you know, Somebody say, you know, well, not people say, I'm sure you have, you have this experience. People that you like, friends you've never met for years, suddenly you meet and then you sit down and you talk. Two hours have passed, he said, hey, I thought it was only 30 minutes. Time seems to pass so fast. But people that you don't like, right? You know, your, maybe your next door neighbor. You know, each time you wake up, you walk out the, the door, you see him standing there. Right? It's, like, it's like forever he, she, she's standing there waiting for him to come out. So we we'll always have this. And in the in the Buddha's teachings, Buddha to the eight worldly condition too. We kind of run away from all those things. Okay. So but there's a cure for there's, there's a cure for it. So in the book, Robert Rice said it's called it, that it, through mindfulness meditation, you can actually minimize it. So you want to know you read that book. I'm not promoting this book. I don't get any commission for that. <laughs> okay? So contentment. So the more we seek satisfaction in material goods. The less we find them happy. Can you can you ever be happy with all the money that you have? With the job that you have? You know, in, 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 uh, in my in my younger days, you know, I used to get calls from hit hunters for for, for you know for, for new job opportunities. First question you ask me, are you happy in your job? I said, yeah, I'm happy, but I said you can make me happy. <laughs> 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 so we are happy, yeah, but we can always be happy. Right? So in other words, we are always wanting more. Right? Okay? <laughs> so people, so the salary, you have a short life, you know, you, you, you work in a company, you first join, you're very excited, very happy. After a while, you say, hmm, this, this company is terrible. It's worse than my previous company. Right? Isn't it? I'm sure you have your system. Okay, so contentment, right? Okay. Let's see. Contentment is a Pali word in Santuti. So every word has every, every, every spiritual value in, in English that we talk about, there's a Pali equivalent just to show you that actually. Um, and they are from the sources. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not just plucking them out from somewhere. And uh, in, the, in the Dhammapada, it says that there's no satisfying sensual desires, even with the rain of gold coins. <laughs> That money, you can never be satisfied with. Of course, in, in economic, there's such concept called the goods of snob appeal. Right? If, for example, suddenly your, your, your Gucci handbags becomes as cheap as the one you can find in Patalik Street, do you think you still buy your Gucci handbag? Probably not. Okay? Because certain goods, you want them to be expensive. Then, then you say, if I buy it, oh, I have achieved something. Right? I remember when I first started working, we have, we have, we have an off, and you know those we call it office boy pions. Right? I, I remember those days he was earning probably 400 ringgit a month. And when he first got his salary, he was very happy. He told me, he said, boss, he said, they are size of the bleed. Kasut Babi. I said, what for Kasut? Belly shoe. You know how much the belly shoe costs? 450 ringgit. He said, he said he has to take, he has to borrow 50 ringgit to buy the shoe. <laughs> So we call goods of snob appeal. Right? Study that in economics, right? So contentment is one of the 38 blessings of the appeal. So it's good to be contentment, right? right? But contentment doesn't mean that we don't have aspiration. It doesn't mean that we don't aspire for, for something. Right? It doesn't mean that, right? Okay, let's see. Next one. Friendship. Friendship is also a very important part. Uh, friendships are critically important to every aspect of our lives, especially as we age and change our work and social life. As we get older, you, you need less money, but you need more friends. <laughs> Some people say, right? as you get older, right? As you get older, you, you probably your, your children are so normal with you. Right? I think it's like very typical of many uh, urban urban phenomena in. KL, DJ, I'm sure many of you, your, 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 your children are normal with you. I've got, I've got three very good friends. The, the children are, are, are normal here. I just left the, the two of them. <laughs> they all, all move over to either Singapore or Australia. So maybe very soon there will be more, more people moving. 
<laughs> All right, so friendship, friendships are critically important to every aspect of our life, remember that, especially as we age and change our work and social life. Decades of research at Harvard in fields from gerontology to sociology proves just that. Right? It is the single most important factor in determining a person's happiness. Right? Uh, that, that is why it's, I remember there was a research done about some, some old people when they stay in a nursing home. So if the nursing home can create an environment, a happy environment, people are very happy then. Okay, so relationship and happiness, this is in the Harvard Gazette. Our relationships and how happy we are in our relationship has a powerful influence on our health. All right? Taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationship is a form of self-care. So, well, vitamins are unnecessary if you think they are important, but you know the other thing is, is friendship, tending to relationship is a form of self-care. That, I think, is a revolution. So what is what the Buddhism is going to say? Kalyana Vita. So in Buddhism, we talk about this word Kalyana Vita. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha said, let him associate with friends who are noble, energetic, and pure in life. Let him be cordial and refined in conduct. Thus, full of joy, he will make an end of something. So even in 2,600 years ago, long before Harvard Gazette had that article, the Buddha already knew that. The Buddha already talked about it, the importance of friendship. Okay? So at the, end, at the end of today's talk, you don't need to, you don't really need to read those books. Right? Just, just, just continue with your, with your practice of the Dharma. You have to find that all the modern psychologists, modern neuroscientists have been talking about the Buddha had already said in 2007 years ago. Because they are true. If it is true, it's true for all time. All right? And like all Buddha's teachings, they are not only true, but they are useful. Useful for what? Useful for our happiness. So the Buddha's teaching has a very clear instruction. Uh, and then here in the entire holy life, not half of it comprises of friendship. Have you heard of this, this phrase? The entire holy life, not half of it comprises of it. In part of it. The Buddha said this to whom? Who did the Buddha say this to? Do you know? Huh? Huh? Ananda. Right? You know who is Ananda, right? So Ananda was one of the Buddha's uh, you know, sometimes you read, the, you say the Buddha's favorite disciple. The Buddha had no favorite disciple, no cronies of the Buddha. No favorite disciple. It was the, it was the, well, in a way, it's like his, his uh, personal attendant. But even that, Ananda only became his personal attendant very much late in Buddha's life. Do you know that? Uh, he, the Buddha, Ananda was never his attendant the moment when the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. Ananda said, come from, I want to be your attendant. When did the Ananda become the Buddha's attendant? Do you know? Around 50? 55? Yeah, well, it was about 55. I suppose those days we retired at age of. We retired at age of 55. Those are those days. <laughs> okay. So Ananda became like his personal attendant when he was 55. So one day An Ananda from his meditation came and, and talked to the Buddha and said, Oh, you know. Blessed one, I think half the holy life is about friendship. Half the holy life is about friendship. When Buddha heard it, what did Buddha say? Buddha said, no, Ananda, not half the holy life. In the entire holy life comprises of friendship. So, so we have this word called Kalyana Mita. The word Kalyana, Mita means friends, isn't it? For the word Mita, you got Metta. You know the word Metta? Metta. That is why I think uh, Venerable Gunaratana, Bhante H. Gunaratana, he translated metta as friendliness. Friendliness. Yeah, you read his books. Uh, you know, you know, Gunaratana, people are Venerable H. Gunaratana. So Bhante Gunaratana, he written many books on meditation. So he translated metta as friendliness. Because he actually comes from this word, metta. Metta. So friend. Friendliness, someone who is friendly, kind. So, kal Kalyana Mita. And uh, kal Kalyana Mita could, could be your, your friends who are your peers. It could also be your teacher. Because your teacher is also your Kalyana Mita. You know? In the Tibetan tradition, for example, the, uh, there's this word, which I'm sure some of you have heard, called uh, Geishi. 
Geishi, G E S H E, Geishi Lan, Geishi, we call Geishi Lan. So Geishi actually means is a is a better word for Kalyana Mita. So even so, the, the Geishi who is a highly qualified master or teacher, so he so he's a he's a, he's a Kalyana Mita. He's a spiritual friend in that sense. Okay, so spiritual friends are very important. So friendship is a place that you know. Right, right, people. So you you study organizational behavior, all right? He says uh, this according to any how happy you are at work depends in part on how much initiative you take. When we express creativity, help others, suggest improvements and do additional tasks on the job, we make our work more rewarding, and happy, and more in control. So when you work, you must be happy. But if you're not happy with your job, you know. Can you imagine how many hours you spend in the office? Isn't it? I, you know, when I look, when I look, look back after having worked for almost, I don't know, almost 40 years now, one consolation I can I can say to myself with pride is that I've always enjoyed every time. <laughs> Maybe I've got some good karma, probably already exhausted with it or something. So I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> So it's very important for us to be happy with, with what we do. And if we want to move to another job, all right, we must not burn bridges. You know, meaning of burn bridges, we must always continue to have a good rapport with your ex boss. And 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 I know that for for a fact is because I got called back to my previous company after having left the company twice. So so this means that yeah, they think that he's not a bad guy. You can come back. He's a good guy, <laughs> right. Right. Rather than you know, but yet you you hear people you know when they quit their job, they say, my goodness, thank you that place was a <laughs> So it's a terrible place, you know. So how I wonder how I could have stayed in that place for so long. This place is like heaven, but it lasted only three days. <laughs> After three days, heaven turned to hell. <laughs> okay. So you see, even in the Buddhist. Uh, classification of realms of existence. In the Theravada, we said we have 31 planes of existence. I think it's too many to count. Let's use the Mahayana. Let's use the like six realms. So if you look at the six realms, you're actually living the six realms every day. One day you are in heaven, one day you are like in the heavenly realm, the next day you are in hell realm, the next day you are like a hungry ghost, <laughs> the next day when you get, when people upset you, you behave like a titan, like a demon. You know that? Very occasionally you will behave like a human being. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, so right like So how we live our life. Now, this must be very important because if you remember in the eightfold path, this warrants a special uh, attention. Then. Eightfold path you have one called summer ajiva. Right like It must be very important. It must be very important. Even monks have a right like life livelihood. What, what monks can do, what monks cannot do, right? Maybe we shall not go into that. We are not monks. <laughs> so in a Sama Ajiva, in the Vika Janu Sutta, the Buddha says there's the case where a lay person, you see, this discourse is given to a lay person. So it's not always that the Buddha only talks to monks and nuns. The Buddha also talks to lay people, like you and me. So in this discourse, there is a case where a lay person, knowing the income and outflow of his wealth, may get a livelihood he feel. Neither a spendthrift nor a penny pincher thinking, thus will my income exceed my outflow and my outflow will not exceed my income. I'm just giving you a literal translation, right? Now what we, you know what this means? That you live in you live in moderation. You earn so much, you know how much you can spend. Don't don't exceed your what you learn and be in debt. Okay? In, in fact, there's another this course called the blessings of debtlessness. The blessing of debtlessness. Okay. So it's very important that if we can, you know, we, we maintain our life right, in, in mm -hmm. terms of our income. Because it talks about here, you know, life we like spend if you don't you don't spend, you don't overspend. Alright? You don't overspend. Okay? Neither do you be a penny pincher. Penny pincher is like a stingy person. Right? Stingy person. You know, like in 
like in the kind of the, 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 the look at ten centimeter like a block cut wheel. The problem is now people can actually think like that. <laughs> so you don't have to be a, a stingy person. Right? So you don't likewise don't overspend. Right? So right, like compassion. Now compassion is one of those terms which has which has so so popular today that that, that with this word if you just type in this word compassion and on, uh, you, you Google the word compassion, I think you will probably get a few thousand hits. <laughs> Now, while science has made great strides in treating pathologies of the human mind, far less research exists to date on positive qualities of the human mind, including compassion, altruism, and empathy. Yet, these pro-social traits are innate in us and lie in the very centerpiece of common humanity. Compassion is something that the Buddha talks about. One of his first teachings was actually about compassion. And the Buddha is also regarded as the Maha Karuniko. That means the great compassionate one. The fact that the Buddha stayed back for 45 years to teach the Dhamma is because of his great compassion, isn't it? He has the wisdom, but if he has no compassion, he might think, what, what on earth, what, what the heck do I go and teach these dumb people? You know, they're not going to listen to me. They're, they're, they're not going to practice my teachings. But our compassion, he taught for 45 years. So that is the kind of compassion that the Buddha talks about. And because of that compassion, he, when he had the first 60 arahants, what, what did he tell the arahants? He said, go not in single file, but, oh sorry, no, go not, not as a group, but go individually, go in single file. 60 different directions, so that more people can benefit from the Dhamma. So that was the, the kind of compassion that the Buddha had. Right? Like he wanted the teachings to be made known to other people. Okay? So, so science today is slowly is studying is compassion. Compassion is one of those, you know, those, uh, those, those what, what, what they call things that you, you can't quantify. You know? Very difficult to quantify. It's not a hard science. It's not like physics. It's not like quantum physics. You can quantify. It's not like you know, quantum physics. You know, it's very difficult, right? It's not a hard sciences, right? But he says our our capacity for to feel compassion has ensured the survival and thriving of our species over millennia. And Robert Wright talks a little bit about that in terms of natural selection. Right? For this reason, the center of compassion and altruism research in education, CCAN, if you Google this, CCAN, at Stanford University School of Medicine in 2008, with the explicit goal of promoting, supporting, and conducting rigorous scientific studies of compassion and altruistic behavior. So in 2008, that's 2,600, 2,700 years ago, um, a body like Stanford, you know, Stanford University is not any run of new university. You know, these are highly well-known universities. So they set up a center to study compassion. Can you imagine that? So now compassion is studied at the university. Right? Maybe you can get a PhD in, in, in compassion. But that does not necessarily make you a compassionate person. Right? Okay. So compassion, the Dalai Lama in his book called The Art of Happiness, all right, which was actually also written with a Howard Kaplan who was a, was a, 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 a psychiatrist. He says, compassion is a state of mind that is non-violent, non-harming, and non-aggressive. It is based on the wish for others to be free of suffering and the commitment to alleviate their suffering. It begins with a wish for oneself to be free from suffering, enhance it, and extend it to others. So in this book called The Art of Happiness, which is one of the best-selling books, right? Written jointly with Albert Kaplan, right? So it basically talk, talks about Buddhism as a way of life, as a spiritual quality that you can practice. Mm -hmm. So in this book, you will not read about, you know, what happened when a person dies, the reincarnation. You will not read books about rainbow bodies. You will not read books about how 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 many times you must bow in front of in front of a Buddha. So you bow three times and how and how, how far your legs should, should be placed, you know. When I was first starting to learn Buddhism, I, I was told if you are a man, your leg will be placed in this, this manner. If you are a woman, the leg will be placed in the other manner. Otherwise, the devas will not be happy. So that's, that's, that's the form of Buddhism where we are no longer interested in. So Karuna, that's the, that's the Buddhist word. 
Okay, bodhicitta is related to that altruistic mind. So I think this is mindfulness. Right now, Harvard study of 15,000 individuals across 80 countries show that we are happiest when we are mindful at of the moment, and we are least happy when the mind is wandering. <laughs> okay. The conclusion is happiness is not found in external things at all, but it's a power we hold within ourselves. Isn't that what we learn in the Dharma? Do we need the mad killing worth to tell us this? <laughs> we don't need that. Right? But I show this just to, to, to tell you that, yeah, I mean, all that we have been studying, all that we have been trying to practice, all these things can be verified. Today, mindfulness is so popular in the West that it, it seems to have lost its, uh, its roots, lost its roots. Right? So they look at mindfulness in a very secular way. In a secular, S-E-C-U-L-E-R, in a very secular way. And it's purely therapeutic. Right? If you're unhappy, learn mindfulness. If you, or even when, when, when you've got a psychosomatic illness, you go and you see a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist says, okay, let's do mindfulness. All because of this, this guy called John Kabat-Zinn. <laughs> John Kabat-Zinn, he popularized, he made, he made mindfulness so popular in, in, in the West that people say, yeah, it's a problem, practice mindfulness. Okay. So happiness and meditation. Do you know who is this man? Have you met him before? Yeah? Have you seen him before? You seen him in Berlin? No, he was here, I think last December. Mingyu, Mingyu, M I N G U R. Mingyu. Mingyu. So, and, and uh, this is Professor Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin. So, following his research, the meditation practice might help to shift brain activity from the right frontal area of the brain associated with depression, anxiety, and worry to the left, which has been found to correlate with feelings of happiness, excitement, joy, and so increasingly when neurosurgeons, neuroscientists do all this research and they found that then there's, there's a lot that they, they can learn in the Buddhist concept of the mind. So every year the Dalai Lama actually, he has this called mind-life uh, dialogue. Is that right? Mind-life, mind, M-I-N-D, mind, mind, life, mind and life dialogue. When you have meetings with neuro, neuroscientists, you know, uh, biologists and, and all things to study the mind from a scientific perspective, and then asking the Dalai Lama, how does the Buddhist look at it? Right. Once uh, this, this, this neurosurgeon was producing a very big term, it's called neuroplasticity. Do you remember? Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. In other words, our, our mind is, is uh, malleable. The Dalai Lama laughed. Oh, oh yeah, okay, now you, you, you found it. Uh, 2,600 years ago, Nagarjuna already talked about it. <laughs> but, he, but he didn't use the word neuroplasticity. Right? You know, America is very good in coining new terms. Right? They're very good in marketing, branding. Right? But, but it's good because all these things seems to, seems to tell us and it gives us that confidence that, hey, you're on the right path. You're actually doing the right thing. Right? You're doing the right thing. In fact, the Dalai Lama was once asked, what happens if science were to prove that a particular teaching of the Buddha is not true. But let's say, well, if that's the case, we stop. We just stop. That particular teaching, we, we don't use it. But then Dalai Lama asks, can you tell me which aspect is the sign proven it not to be true? But so far, they don't they come up with that. Maybe they will, I don't know. Alright, so happiness and meditation. The so mind is chief in the Dhammapada, isn't it? The very first statement in the mind, uh, in, in, our, in our book, in the Dhammapada, it's a, called the, the words of uh, the path of truth. He says, all that we are is a result of what we have taught. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. If one speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows one, as the wheel follows the fruit of the ox that draws the wagon. If one speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows one, like the shadow that never leaves us. That's the nature of the mind. That's what neuroplasticity is all about. It's malleable. You can change. Right? So if you cannot pronounce that word, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you just know that our mind is malleable. The Dalai Lama also said that one of the wonderful things about, about our defilements 
we all have a lot of these performance, right? We have greed, we have anger, we have pride, we have jealousy, we have ingratitude, we have impatience. And the Dalai Lama says, one of the beauty of all these defilements that we have is, what is the beauty of it? What is the beauty of it? What is the characteristic of all these defilements that we have? Hmm? You can understand it, but it has got one special characteristic, which all of us know, because we are all seasoned practitioners, right? or seasoned students of the Dharma. What are the three characteristics of, of existence? Huh? Uh, you, you must know, after your Sunday schools come and ask you, you cannot answer, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> Impermanent suffering, non, non, non self. Right? So the Buddha, the Dalai Lama said, one of the, the things that's so wonderful about all these defilements is that they are impermanent. They are also can change. In other words, we can change our greed, we can change our anger, we can change our pride, we can change our impatience, we can change our ingratitude. We can transform all those negative emotions into positive emotions. You see? So, in other words, Buddhists are not pessimistic. While we acknowledge that, yeah, we have got all these terrible things, a lot of suffering, a lot of these defilements, but, yeah, so what? These defilements, they are all impermanent. They can, they can be changed, but you must make effort. You must have effort, you must have determination. Isn't it? You see, so, so, in, so the Buddha's teaching was very clear about it. So we can, act, we can actually. So as a mental science, so you can see neuroscientists, Christoph Koch, Sandy Theory of Consciousness. So they're discussing about consciousness with the Dalai Lama. What does the Dalai Lama know about Western concept of consciousness? Yes, Bill Robert, you said this is true. Okay, so this was oh, 2017, so it's about almost three years now. No, two and a half. Right? So why is it? It's subtitled as The Science and Philosophy of Meditation and Enlightenment. He was always quick to clarify that when he said why Buddhism is true, he's referring to, to the scientific aspects of Buddhism, like Buddhism from the, as a mental science, not Buddhism as a religion. He said he doesn't know enough of that. All right. So why Buddhism is true? So he combines evolutionary psychology with neuroscience to defend the Buddha's claims that human suffering is a result of not seeing the world clearly. Is this uh, is this a standard Buddhist proposition? It isn't it? What do we do with Vipassana? What is the end result of Vipassana? Or what is the end result of mindfulness meditation? Or what, is, what does Vipassana mean? Vipassana means what? Insight. Insight into what? Insight into nature of reality, isn't it? <laughs> Even didn't we really say seeing things as they clearly are? Yeah. That's what we, we, we do that. And what is it that we want to see clearly? What do we want to see? Hmm? 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 You want to see clearly. What, what is it that, what is the end result of doing mindfulness meditation? Or what is the end result of insight of the person? You see, you see three things again, right? You see dominance, you see the nature of, of phenomena as fleeting, as subject to change. They're never stagnant. They're never stagnant. They're always subject to change. Because of the nature of change, right? They are unsatisfactory. And they are not self. You have no control of it. Right? In that book, he talks about like many people you know in Western psychology thought there's a there's a CEO in the mind that they can control everything. But then you can't in the Buddha's teachings in the uh, the discourse on non-self, anatta lakana sutta. What did the Buddha say? So if you analyze, what is mind? Mind is feeling, perception, consciousness, mental activity. Feelings that arise. Can you control your feelings? Can you tell feelings don't arise? Can you? Perception arise. Can you tell perception don't arise? You can. And after a long while, you find that your your as, as you get older, as, as, you know, as, as, your, as you age, your, your, you lose perception. Your clarity of perception also gets less. Then you, you tend to have less 
You remember next thing. You lose memory. Can you control it? Then in the Discord, the Buddha also said, you look at this body of ours, this rupa, this body. Can you say this body is mine? If this body is mine, if I own this body, then I can tell this body, okay, body, don't grow old. I will send you to Korea. You'll be safe. You can come back to a new face. But can, you, but can, can that happen? The body must be grow old. Isn't it? Can you tell the body, don't fall sick? You can. You can try to, to pre prevent the virus, you can. But sometimes, you try to level back, you can still get the virus. But each time when I go my, for my medical, I ask my, my physician, let's say, you know, he said, oh, we'll do cancer marking. I said, can you do all the cancer markings that you have? He said, there's no such as all the cancer markings. <laughs> it's impossible. You take care of one cancer marking, they can have some other cancer. You just can't, but, all the, but it doesn't mean that you, you become pessimistic and all oh, life is suffering, you know, I suffer. Can you should do what you level back and then the rest just, just leave it to your karma. It happens, it happens. Okay? So, human suffering is a result of not seeing the world clearly. So if you see the world clearly, then you're not attached to that, that prominent. When mindfulness comes, comes into play, then things are different. So he proposes us that the solution is meditation, which will make us better, happier people. It will also ultimately save us from ourselves as individual and as a species. He, he said that he's, a, he, he's, a, he's one of those guys who, who, who believe that you know, if you're not careful, the world will come to an end. Like climate change, you know, we should we'll destroy this planet. And you, you, you want to have a planet that for our future generation. So when you do meditation, there are a lot of good effects. That's what I'm saying. All right. So these feelings, anxiety, despair, hatred, and greed have elements of delusion. Elements you have to be better off without. Are, are these things good for us? No, they are not good for us. That is why today we talk about transforming negative emotions to positive emotions. So all these are considered negative emotions. Despair, hatred, greed. And if you think it would be better off, imagine how the world would be. After all, feeling the despair, hatred, and greed, and foster wars and atrocity. So if what I'm saying is true, if the basic sources of human suffering and human cruelty are indeed enlarged by the product of delusion, there is value in this question of delusion in your life. It's a delusion. And, and, and the whole basis of the dependent origination is to cut off ignorance, cut off delusion. The Buddha talks about greed, hatred, and delusion. Moha. So, so delusion is the one that, that gets us stuck in this cycle of birth and grief. Even in this very life, it, it, how do we get that out? So this book, so according to Robert Wright, you try mindfulness meditation, it helps. It helps you see things in a different perspective. You kind of have a paradigm shift in the way you look at things. Right? Okay? So the solution, he says there are other spiritual traditions that address the human predicament with insight and wisdom. But Buddhist meditation, along with his underlying philosophy, now it's very interesting he mentioned in this book, he said in, he said, in the Western, he said in the West, Everybody is so crazy over, over mindfulness that they, they forgot the roots of where mindfulness comes from. <laughs> they forgot the roots. So here he's saying that, but Buddhist along with underlying philosophy. So in other words, mindfulness meditation, you must not forget the underlying philosophy. Right? And if you read the Satipatthana Sutra, basically the mindfulness discourse is about getting us out of illusion. So that is the addresses it in strictly direct and concrete. Buddhism's diagnosis of the human predicament is fundamentally correct and that its prescription is deeply valid and urgently important. So prescription, what is a prescription? Prescription is basically the Eightfold Path. The eightfold path. So if you practice the Eightfold Path, so that is the prescription. Okay? So conclusion, so no matter how many books you read on Buddhist insights on the human beings, you won't need much unless you find yourself a regular practice. It's the practice that counts, it's a practice that slowly lets you see the delusion in our constant stream of desires and emotions. 
that is after all why we call it practice. As it can lead us to understanding, and understanding can lead to realization. Okay? So practice, from a Buddhist perspective, is not only mindfulness, because our practice is the eightfold path. Okay? If you only practice mindfulness, that means you are practicing one full path. Okay? One full path. Okay? Some people don't even practice, some people say, I only practice concentration then. Then you only also practice one full path. You only practice precept, then you practice three full path. <laughs> okay. The practice here, we have to practice the eight full path. So it must be very clear. Right? Because sometimes people used to say, oh, dana is not so important, meditation is more important. But yes, if, if dana is not important, then Buddha wouldn't have even recommended us to practice dana. I think they're all important. Okay, so do we have time for some Q&A? Yeah. Or, or do we end? We end now. We are happy, I'm happy to end. <laughs> is there is somebody in charge? Is there a non-self? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want to have a QA? I'm asking, do you have time for QA? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Next question is, do you have questions? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to ask questions, you, you, you can also uh, say something, you know. You can uh, join or disagree with what I say. Yes?
Nobody you cannot change subs to be here, you cannot be a member. Okay, anything else? No, being being con being con contented in, in life means that you, as I said, there are there are other vague variables in Buddhism. One is called determination, adhikarna, determination. Whatever you do, you must have determination. Make sure that it's successful. All right. The other one is like even a spiritual practice. If you say, oh, I must have con contentment, then how how even to, to, to practice? Right? So there's a there's a Buddhist term called chanda, which means that, that which means that you must make that desire, the strong desire to do something good, right? Right? Like for example, in a worldly life, right? Uh, contentment means that okay, you know you you have the experience, you have the uh, you have the qualification, so you feel that you can do more by moving to a higher job, right? So you apply for a higher position, but you should also bear in mind the higher you you go, the the more problems there will be, isn't it? The more challenges it will be. As we always say, the higher you go, the harder you fall. So we must always have that in mind. But that doesn't mean that you should not as as, as fine. So then what, what then what is your motivation? Your motivation is as you go higher up, you have more money, you can support your pet, you can support your old parents, you can support your, your family, you can give your children a good education, you can support society. BGF can be assured of some donation every, every month. But you have moved on to the higher job, right? Things don't 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 work out. You don't complain, you don't swear, you move on. So you must know where where to where to, to put the brake. Okay? So contentment, yes, but there's also determination. There's also effort. Buddha says you must have effort. You know the, the the last word of the Buddha before he passed away is a very dynamic word. It doesn't seem to to imply contentment, what did the Buddha say? Strive on with diligence. You know, the last the last message of the Buddha before he passed away in the Mahaparini Panasa. Strive on with diligence. Is that contentment? Okay. Yeah. You know how you mentioned forget and forgive? Forget and forgive. Uh, how to differentiate we are in stage of forget? Ah, well, take some numb, numbing pills and forget about this. <laughs> some kind of long Well, we can, we may not be able to forget certain things that was done to, to us, but we can forgive. Because, for example, a person did something bad to us, right? We can forgive that, that person by saying that, number one, he did it out of ignorance. Number two, he understood the law of karma. He did that, he will reap that, 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 that result. If he is very angry, he shouted at us, he, or he, he even tried to, to beat us, but he didn't get the reasons. So all those actions, he will reap the consequences of his actions. So we can forgive him for being an ignorant person. In future, we will be careful not to be near him. But we can forget what he has done. In one of the discourses, uh, I think the Arana Vibhanga Sutra. Buddha said you can criticize a person, but you criticize the action. You can criticize the action rather than criticize the person. So if you have that kind of mind frame, then you, then you, you find that you, know, you can forgive what he has done, but you will not for, you will not forget some of the things that, that has been done. But does mean that when you when you are not able to forget that you have you have thoughts of anger, you you let it pass. You can also think, oh, it could be my karma that I'm, I'm faced with such a person. So there are many aspects of, of how you, you look at it. You can, you can change your mind, you can change in your mind. Okay? But most of the time, we, we don't want to forget, we don't want to forget. <laughs> right?
Well, there are, there are different discourses the Buddha talks about that. One is called the Fortress I think there are five of it. And the first one is that something that you say must be true, yeah, and then it must be, be, be spoken gently, right? Spoken with a kind heart, right? And then it is uh, useful, and then it is timely. It's timely. Timely means there, you know, there are many. Sometimes when it is not ready for a person to understand certain teaching, once when it's a time later, uh, for example, this this, this monk named Vachagota, uh, who was a Brahmin, then he when after listening to the Buddha's teachings, he was very inspired, and he became he said he wants to take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, which he did. Then, but he has always been troubled by this concept of soul, non-self, the soul. You know the Brahmins. The, the, the Brahmin, Brahminism at that time believed that yeah, we have a soul, we have a permanent soul, that when we die, this soul will reunite with the God Brahma. So the Brahmins they believe in that. But Buddhism doesn't have that belief. So he's all in trouble. So he came to see the Buddha, he wanted to ask the Buddha, lesson one, do I have a soul or do I not have a soul? Right? Did the Buddha say yes? Did the Buddha say no? But the Buddha in that occasion chose to remain silent. Then, of course, Buddhist scripture is about three times. Right? So the guy must ask three, three, three times, right? You read the Buddhist text. So, so Bhattacharya asked three times, and three times the Buddha didn't un un answer him. So Bhattacharya went out. Then Ananda, as usual, was nearby, and Ananda asked the Buddha, he said, why didn't you explain to Bhattacharya because you have always thought non-self, no soul, anatta lakana sutta, and so on. Then the Buddha says, to Vachakuta, that Vachakuta has all this while believed that he has a soul. <laughs> Suddenly, if I tell him that you have no soul, he cannot accept it. You'll be, you'll be destroyed, you'll be in despair, you lose all hope. You know, all his life is believed that he has a soul. Suddenly, just a couple of weeks, he, he comes to, to understand the Dharma, he's been told that he has a no soul. Then the Buddha said, if I say yes, no, you, no, you have you have a soul. That I'm not telling the truth. So the Buddha said, Vachapata is not yet ready to understand this profound teaching. So he remains silent. So sometimes when people are, are not ready, so we, you don't have to to say it. Especially if someone is very, you know, especially someone from another religion, you really believe in his religion, and then here you try to, to, to tell him. There's no creator God, there's no soul, you always believe in that. You're not going to go anywhere. Until at the time that he's really, when, when he is interested, then you can talk to him. That's from the, 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 the spiritual side. But I'm sure you can think of daily uh, examples. Right? You know, some people say, you know, if, if the person is, is terminally ill, right? and then the, the wife also terminally ill, you, you tell the wife the husband is, is terminally ill. <laughs> You know, there are, there are many questions on them we are not sure when is the right time. So it requires a lot of skills. Okay. But remember, uh, the Buddha says something when you say it's true, it must be true. And very important, it must be useful. It must be useful. Sometimes it is pleasant to listen to, sometimes it's not pleasant to listen to. The truth can, can hurt sometimes. Huh? And of course, the right time to say it. Okay. So this is in the. Vacha, B A C A. So you, you can read the video. Otherwise, I think I'm going to go to the Okay. It's in the Book of Five. So the five, there are five things, right? So Book of Five, Anguttara, Kaya. Okay? So is there anything, anything else troubling you? Anything you cannot see? Trying to learn from the learn teachings of the Buddha. Uh -huh. And apparently uh, there's also this this thing that they say that it's very difficult to actually identify what is the learn teachings of the Buddha. Can you share something about this? Okay. Uh, yeah. But when we say early teachings of the Buddha, we are referring to the period before the before the rise of sectarianism, right? So basically, when you say early teachings, we are referring to two, two sets of scriptures. 
One is the Pali scriptures, Pali canon, right? And the uh, and, and the, uh, in the Agamas, the, the Sanskrit scriptures, the early scriptures, because there are a lot of parallels there. Have a lot of parallels there. Okay. Now, why people say that the early the, because when they compare the Pali canon, right, and the uh, the Pali canon is the scriptures of the Theravada school, right? And then when you look at the uh, the, the Agamas, they are basically used in the Savastivada school. That's the other major school of Buddhism, which subsequently Mahayana Buddhism and then so on. So when scholars study these two sets of scriptures, even though they are they operate very in different parts of India, you know, one like I think the Savastivada is in the northwest area. So when they study the, the, the discourses, they find a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities. Okay? So which means that that is the most consistent, uh, consistent part of the we don't really know exactly what the Buddha spoke, right? What the Buddha thought. But the closest we have is, for example, the Pali Canon is the most complete in, 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 in itself. Likewise, the Savastivada scriptures, which is the Chinese Agamas, right? Which you have in the Chinese Agamas. So when you compare all these scriptures, they are very, very sim similar. The only difference is location. Where it was held. You know, in the Pali text, the Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was in Champa, for example, in the Pali Canon. Same discourse. Maybe another discourse once the Buddha was in another city. Now that's, that's because you look at the, the Indian case. The Indians are not, not too particular about history. They're more particular about the content. So then you look at the details about the content, they're very similar. They're very, very similar. Okay? Now you have the Satipatthana Sutta, right? You have both Satipatthana Sutta and Maha Satipatthana Sutta. You also have got the Sanskrit version. Right? So there are some differences, there are some parallels. But overall, you would say 80 per percent they are very similar. Okay? So that's the reason why people say we should go back to the early scriptures. But that does not mean that we look down on later scriptures. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. The Mahayana scriptures like, like the Amitabha Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, they are actually much, much later. They came much later. Then the Tibetan text, the, the, the Tibetan also have, have got the canon, right, called the Kanjo. So in the, in the canon, they also have got the scripture. And then they got the commentaries. Right? So in the same argument, there are some people who say, oh, let's not look at those commentaries. But I don't know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert. <laughs> you should read the commentaries or not. But the commentaries actually helps you to understand the sutra. Some people say you don't need that. So it's, it's up. And some people even say you, you don't need tipitaka, you only need dui tipitaka. You just need the sutta and the vinaya. Because Abhidhamma is not the Buddha's word. It's a compilation of, of, of the Buddha's teachings. So there are, there are different arguments. So you, you need a scholar to tell you that. Yeah. Karma and Uber, yeah. Yes. And most of the time people will say, oh, it's my, it's my karma, or I need to do this thing so that I uh, get a better return of the Buddha. But in actual fact, did the Buddha teach karma and Uber? Some say the Buddha never actually taught karma and Uber in the past. He taught Uber. He never taught about karma and Uber? Well, if you, if, you, if you rely, as I said, we rely on the, on, on, on the scriptures, right? On the Pali Canon or even in the, in the Agamas. You have a lot of references where Buddha talks about the river, right? For example, the famous uh, Salayaka Sutta. The Buddha says, if you do the 10 wholesome actions upon dissolution of the body, you will be reborn in one of the happy states. If you perform the ten unwholesome actions upon dissolution of the body, you will not be reborn in the heavenly state. So that's one, one example. And the Salayaka Sutta is found in both the Pali Canon and the, and the Alchemist. You have to have that. Okay? 
when the Buddha, when Prince Siddhartha became enlightened, all right, remember he, he, he was re recounting his past birth, <laughs> and then not only his past birth, but the past birth of many other beings, and he could see beings being reborn because of their karma, right? So that's another, uh, and another source. So there are many, many sources in the, in the scriptures we say that uh, when, when we, we know that Buddha actually talks about rebirth. I think the key word is upon dissolution of this body. Uh, upon dissolution of, you find that, that phrase increasingly in many, many scriptures. Now, modern day Buddhists <laughs> like to say, uh, like Robert Wright, he said he, he doesn't know about karma and rebirth. He said he doesn't know about reincarnation. He has no knowledge about that. And he's not interested in doing that. So today in the West, there's a group of Buddhists, there's a movement called Secular Buddhism. Secular, S-E-C-U-L-A-R. Secular Buddhism. Where they, they say what is important is mindfulness meditation, okay, practicing precepts, but no, no belief in karma, no belief in rebirth. More, they don't believe in rebirth. They say because we do not know. We do not know. So, so if you follow that approach, then and, and, and they say that, oh, the Buddha just used the word karma and rebirth because that was a term that was practiced in India at that time. Now, scholars also, de also debate that because not all, all, uh, all scholars at that time believed in rebirth. Not all of them believed in rebirth. Some, uh, they, like, I think, some are what, what they call them, the materialists. They believe that this is the only life when you die and that's the end of all those things. Remember, there are 62 wrong views which the Buddha ex expounded in the Brahma Jala Sutta, the first discourse of the long discourse. And in the 62 wrong views, there are these, these views that people say that there's, there's, no, there's no next life. So, so I think if you look at the early scriptures, uh, there's a lot of references where the Buddha said about rebirth. Okay? But yes, you are right, in the, today in the Western Scholars, particularly people like uh, Stephen Batchelor, we have read his writings, Stephen Batchelor, they, they said, oh, you know, the Buddha doesn't really talk about rebirth, karma is not so important, and, and so on. Okay. <laughs> yes, as for example, in the, in, the, in the modern day, mindfulness, you know, in the, in the, in the mindfulness thing has nothing to do with, with, with Buddhism now. I think I mentioned to some of you uh, two years ago when I was we have an, an office in, in New York, uh, just just opposite the, the New York Library. And one day when I was coming up after lunch, passing the, the library, I saw a, a, I saw a van. There. And then the, the van has a poster which says, "Please come in. Mindfulness meditation in practice. Ten U.S. dollars per minute." <laughs> And so I so I peeped in, I saw there were two persons there, deep meditation. So I'm wondering how much they have paid. <laughs> and the guy said, Would you like to come in? I said, Oh well, thank you. <laughs> so so meditation has now so today in the West you say that uh, you say I'm practicing mindfulness meditation, that doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that you're a Buddhist. It doesn't mean that. It has taken on the word the word is secular, S E C U L A. So 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 mindfulness has been secularized. <laughs> it's been secularized. Right. Sorry, I missed the part of how we can Sanskrit. Mm. Uh, is it too religious or is it written by? Why is that? Why is that? Well, I, I don't even know if Pali is a language. Pali, is, Pali actually means text. Pali means text. So the language of the Pali canon, right? Or the, or the language, the, the scriptures of the Theravada tradition is what we call the Pali canon, right? Then in Mahayana tradition, the scriptures are in Sanskrit. So they are called the Agamas, right? So each of the Pali canon, like right here, the long discourses, the Kanikai, so they have the equivalent in the Sanskrit version. And many of the, the discourses are also found in Who wrote this book? Uh, they, have, they have come through. Well, they're supposed to be the, the words of the Buddha. They're supposed to be the words of the Buddha. So they have, they have come through to oral tradition. You know, you know, it's all oral tradition. 
you pass down through generation after generation. So imagine the sunscreen is in the north west. Around somewhere else. No, the people also the the yeah the north side. So it's kind of like a tax written by different people in a different level because Buddha was going around. I don't think they were uh, they were they were tax uh, remembered by different monks from different parts of, of India, mm -hmm. right? So so they they passed the so whatever they remembered so it passed down through generation. You know the the. The monks those days they are able to re they remember their the memory is very good unlike our memory so they can recite they they, they, they recite they, they remember by reciting isn't it like for example uh, because we keep on doing like like I can recite it so I can recite but if you ask me to break down one word one word I cannot remember you get what I mean so they are they are these monks they are called uh, banikas. Banikas. That means they, they, they spend their time remembering all those, the entire canon, so they, 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 they remember. Then subsequently, I think it was committed to writing like the Pali canon. Only in Sri Lanka, isn't it? Sri, Sri Lanka. So, just like you mentioned, the five precepts is all negative, and then there's a positive Pancha. Well, we use the word Pancha Dhamma. Pancha Dhamma. That's a, that's a very good book uh, called. Uh, Panchasila and Panchadharma. Have you used? Yeah, the book here. It's written by the former Thai Thai Sangharaja, I think Vajira Nyana Varo Rasa. The five precepts. Uh, sorry, it's, it's in English. It's got the five precepts and the five noblest. Five noblest. The five precepts and the five noblest. It's a small little book. It was published in uh, Mahamakut. So does BJ have a copy? Maybe you have. No, no, I mean that, that, that book, The Five Precepts and the Five Ennoblers. The last time I was in Mahindra, I saw that book. <laughs> I think they have that. It's, a, it's a, not a very thick book, but uh, it's, a, it's a wealth of knowledge there. One, one, one of the few books where which tries to give a balance between five precepts and the five ennoblers. They're called ennoblers. Precepts are basically uh, training rules, isn't it? Sikha. Pancha Sila, so Sikha. You read the Panavipata Veratmatni Sikha. The word Sikha, so it's a training rule. Training you to abstain from this, from this, from this, from this. But in five, the noblest tells you what you should do. So it kind of balance. Yeah, I think we should have to have that. We, 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 we recite that. Then. Okay. <laughs> Whether you want it to be a bean of lower scope 
von dem auf jedes Kopf, auf jeden Fall. Okay? Wie mir noch. 